going to uh, do this uh, a little backwards. I was going to do the presentation first and then show you examples afterwards. Uh, but to get this to work, we needed Steve's computer and he needs to get out of here. So what we're going to do is show you what you can get first and then tell you how you can get it afterwards. Um, so in this case, make sure you have the polarizing glass and... Yep. Does everybody okay. see 3D up there? Yeah. No, I see so, oh, sorry. Let me see in a second. <laughs> Just to, uh, quickly, what's going to happen here is I've taken a bunch of HDR images and then I've taken the, the normal exposure. So what I'm going to show you is the normal exposure and it's going to slowly fade into the HDR process image. Um, but the caveats here are both, uh, both the original image and the HDR image are just straight processing. There's no post-processing. So this is not a final result. This is just supposed to show the comparison between what if you were to bring your raw file or your JPEG or whatever and just have it without any <coughs> processing and then the HDR. So, you know, I haven't removed uh, uh, dust spots off the sensor. I haven't sharpened. I haven't color corrected nothing. So you just sit back and watch. It'll be about three minutes. And we'll see. Okay.
switch over here while Steve unplugs this. So, like I said, basically that was just to show you. There was some subtle stuff in there, um, so there was not that much of a difference. Maybe you saw in some of them that had quite a bit of difference. But as soon as we get switched over here, we'll uh, discuss exactly what we did and how we did it. Does it work best in junkyards? <laughs> well, you know, um, when we get when we get going to this, we'll, we'll you'll find out that the difference between HDR and tone mapping and how people like to, to confuse what's going on there. So that's what track is doing on. And it, as some of you probably noticed, some of those images were uh, what, um, have, has everybody been, been to the art gallery? Mm -hmm. Okay, that, so the black and white anaglyphs up there are mine and you saw some of those pictures, so you can see how they've been changed. I saw a lot of voices. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, high dynamic range imaging, and we're going to sort of uh, tailor this to stereo photography, but not necessarily too much. Like I said, I started this off, when I wrote this up, I wrote it up for people that, that weren't necessarily uh, photographic literate, and you'd be surprised how many people now are producing pictures and prints and doing things and don't even know what an f-stop is and don't know what light is, but when you're dealing with high dynamic range, you have to understand what light is and you have to understand how your camera's working, so. Is there anybody that really needs to understand what an f-stop is and um, what, what ISO or the exposure index is, um, shutter speed, like I said, these things I think everybody here pretty much knows. Only if it means something in relation to HDR, which we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, uh, I mean, it means the same thing. There's nothing different about it. But the thing you're going to hear most probably is this EV or the exposure value. And that's basically because now with digital cameras and a lot of other things, you can get um, the same amount of light coming into the camera by using a bunch of different settings, by using um, an f-stop at, at one setting and, and the shutter speed by changing one one step down, you can bump the other one one step up and you get the same exposure value. So you hear people when we're going to say you want to make steps in one or two EV steps, it's, it, that's, that's an exposure value we're talking about. Um, histograms are very important and I know a lot of people don't really even look at histograms on camera, but Basically, a histogram is just a, an image that, or a representation of showing you what's in all the light and the dark pixels in your image. Um, this is a, an example of what an actual histogram looks like. Um, so it's this little uh, uh, graph down here. The top one shows that you've got stuff off to the right and nothing off to the left. The bottom one shows you you've got everything in it, and the one down at the bottom shows you that you're missing stuff off the right. Um, Clipping is another term you'll hear, and clipping is those areas that there was no histogram there to see, which means that, that you've totally blown out the highlights or you've got totally black shadows. And that in HDR is what you're trying to avoid, is how you're going to be able to get none of that clipping going on. And this is just showing you what those look like with that clipping. So um, obviously the one on the left, you're clipping the shadows. You can see how the histogram has been clipped off. There, there, there's, it goes all the way to the top and off the edge. And to the right, obviously, the, the left side, which are the lights that have been clipped because there's nothing there. <coughs> then the dynamic range, this is what we're talking about. And that's just the ratio between the, the maximum and minimum values or the, the light and the dark of an area. And for the most part, probably 80% or more of your images are going to have more dynamic range in them than you can capture with a single image, which means you're almost always going to get either highlights that are blown out or you're going to get black shadows that you can't see. And so the purpose of doing this high dynamic range is to increase that and to be able to do that you have to take multiple images to cover that range. So the actual real definition of high dynamic range is being able to capture more dynamic range than you can capture in a single image. So by the, the strictest definition you cannot have a high dynamic range from a single image. Okay, And we'll talk about what people do to, to, to take single images and, and do things with them, but you have to have multiple images to have a high dynamic range image. Um, and this is sort of a sliding bar, because right now, or, or when digital cameras first came out, they captured a certain dynamic range. As cameras have gotten better, that dyma dynamic range has increased. And there may be some day where what we're needing four exposures for now, they'll have a sensor that can capture all that. So then the high dynamic range is going to have to be even beyond that. Um, the ultimate is when you're going to be able to point your camera at the sun, have it in exposure, a proper exposure, as well as that star that's sitting right beside it. Um, that's never going to happen, so you'll always need high dynamic range imaging. Um, 
basically this is telling you what some what that is. I mean, they actually measure this light in this candelas, um, and the, you can see up there. You know, a regular sunlit scene is about uh, 100,000. Um, the sun itself is 1 billion. Um, the human eye can see about 10,000 to 1 uh, dynamic range or contrast range, but that's when you're looking around. If you're looking at a single object, your pupil and stuff's going to dilate and change with, with what you're looking at, so you never see this full range at once, even though as you look around, you look at the light, this down here in the shadow is going to be out, but when you look down here, it automatically compensates, so you have that range you can see in. <coughs> and this is just a little uh, chart to show you some of the different uh, uh, digital sensors and exactly how much theoretical uh, dynamic range they can capture. So as you can see at the bottom, the HDR image is pretty much infinite uh, because it uses things called floating point, uh, 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 whatever it's called, uh, decimal. So there, there's basically an infinite number that you can store in there. Um, obviously the contrast is the, the ratio of this luminance between the light and the dark spot. Um, and there's two ways of adjusting contrast, and this is where we'll get into with the, the tone mapping of the, the images. Uh, one using a global contrast and one using local contrast. Uh, the difference is, is in global, this is what's uh, sort of exposure um, fusing, or everybody back in film days used to use a graduated neutral density filter or a split filter. That's a global operator where you're basically changing the contrast of the image, but you're changing every if you change every pixel that's at 255 down to 258, every single pixel in the picture is going to be adjusted. Uh, if you adjust something up, all your darks are coming up, all your lights are coming down. So that's global. This local is what is tone mapping uses, and this actually looks at every single pixel, looks at every pixel that surrounds it, and determines from that what that pixel should be. So you're actually changing the contrast locally and not over the entire image. And so that's what, uh, like I said, we'll get into tone mapping. And that's the difference is tone mapping uses this local and, and exposure blending uses the uh, uh, global. Auto exposure bracketing. Um, it's really helpful when, when doing this HDR, and we'll get into how it's actually done in a minute, but we'll go through the definitions here. This is basically a lot of cameras have this automated process where you can set your camera to certain uh, parameters press the button once and it'll take a series of pictures changing one parameter in a certain amount of steps. Um, like I said, different cameras do it differently. Some have better capabilities than others. Um, David Sykes and, and Check Disc, uh, that CHDK for S stereo data maker and stuff, that people call Check Disc. So if you hear people saying Check Disc. But anyway, they've incorporated that into Canon cameras. So you can do it with your point and shoot Canon cameras. So basically, how do you take an HDR image? Well, the first thing, the, the dynamic range of a scene has to exceed what your camera can capture. There's no reason to take 10 images of a scene that can be totally captured in one. So you, the first thing is that you've got to have a high dynamic range scene to be photographing. So then you, only, what's that? So you do that by looking at the camera histogram. Yep. And, we'll, and I'll show you the next one here, do it. But, um, all, and also only use the shutter speed bracketing. If, I mean, you can do it by changing the ISO, by changing the shutter speed, or by changing the f-stop. And you only want to use changing the shutter speed. Obviously changing ISO, each ISO is going to give you a different amount of noise in the picture, different grain structure, noise. Um, if you change the f-stop, you're going to get different uh, depths of field and that's going to cause soft images. So you only want to change the shutter speed when you're doing this. Um, and for the most part, you want to always use the lowest ISO possible because the higher you get, the more noise. And when you're combining four, five, six images together, it's going to take in and amplify that. So the more bracketed images in a set, the less noise you can get. Um, but usually less than about one EV bracketing is not necessary. There are people that shoot at one third. They'll shoot 20 frames at 130V, and you know it's just really not worth that extra effort. Um, a tripod's highly recommended. It's not mandatory because a lot of these um, HDR programs have some fairly good uh, ghosting features in it. You will need a tripod if you're doing it manually, you know, but if you've got the auto exposure bracketing and you know five or seven frames a second, you can fire those off pretty quick. Okay, exactly how do you do it? This is we're going to start out with a manual method. So what you're going to have to do is determine the amount of EV that's in the scene by metering the lightest part and the darkest part. 
Um, so if you take in, in this room, the light of sparks could be a light. So you point your camera at the light and you get a meter reading and say, uh, you're going to use an ISO 100 um, and the F stop of 11. You're going to say, well, the light is one five hundredth of a second. Now you go down and you point at the darkest part of the shadow underneath of the table here, and that's going to be one eighth of a second. So now you know you've got a 6 ED difference in your picture, so now you just need to determine how you want to take and cover that range, how many exposures you want to use and what EV steps you want to use. So in this case, if you want to um, know the specific number of exposures, you divide that EV range by the number you want to take. So if you want to take three exposures to cover that whole range, you would take uh, EV step of two because you're going to need the six exposures there. The same way if you wanted to keep your EV steps at one, you know you need six exposures to do it. Uh, set your camera up on the tripod. Set your ISO and F-stop to what you want, uh, whether, whether it's metered to the scene. And I like to take and set it to the uh, slowest setting first. I like to take my longest exposure first, but you can do it. Um, some cameras won't, if you use an auto exposure, they'll take the, the uh, correct exposure first, then one under, then one over. You can do, you know, any, some of them allow whatever range you want, but by doing it with the longest exposure first, then I have less chance of movement and stuff between the scene. Um, then you just change your sh shutter speed to the next setting. Um, so, you know, rotate your shutter speed dial, click next picture, rotate your shutter speed dial, take next picture until you cover that range. Um, the other one is, like I said, is to be, as John pointed out, is to use the histogram. So you take and you, and you point your scene at the brightest through the darkest, whichever you want to start with first. Take a picture until you got a proper exposure and the histogram's right. And then just keep taking exposures, looking at your histogram each time until there's no more clipping in the other end of it. And that's covered the full range. Now the, the real easy way to do it, like I said, instead of manually is this auto exposure bracketing. And uh, basically, I guess we pretty much go over is just set it up to it. You know, we figured you needed one EV spacing and, and six exposures, so you set your camera to one EV and six brackets. And then you it just cover the ring. What's that? The, the last slide was, wasn't on very long. This one? Yeah. Okay, like I said, uh, basically all we're doing here is, is it's just telling you that uh, <laughs> by using the auto exposure bracket, you've already figured out you need six exposures at one EV or three exposures at two EV, so you just set that in the auto exposure bracketing. That's in the camera. So that tells you there how you do it. And when it does this, the thing with, with the auto exposure bracketing is it always takes it in odd numbers. So it takes one at the proper exposure and then one or two under and one or two over. So you're always getting five ex exposures out of it, even though it's covering the same range. Um, so as we said down there, if you do want three exposures at two EV, it'd be one normal one and two EV over and one and two V under. If you're doing five exposures at one, it would be normal one, one EV over, one, two EV over, one EV under, and one, two EV under. So this will show you the bracketing here. So what we've done is that we've taken exposure. This is two, two EV plus two EV, which means it's overexposed by two stops. There it is overexposed by one stop. There is what the camera thought would be the proper exposure for this scene. There is, is one exposure under one uh, f-stop under and two stops under. So you see how here you've got all the detail in the clouds, but all the shadows are clipped in it. You see back here at 2EV, you've got all the shadows are, are properly exposed, but the sky is totally blown out. So you can see there's just no way that this picture um, you know, you can take this into Photoshop here, and yes, you can take and use shadows and highlights to bring out a little bit more, but you're never going to be able to bring out more than what's actually there in the picture. So this is the actual HDR image. After you've, you've merged all those together, this is what it comes out as. Sucks, right? You know why? That, because that HDR image is a 32-bit image, and we're showing it on an 8-bit screen here. There, there's only one or two screens out there that are HDR and they're thirty, forty thousand dollars each right now. So there is no HDR display. So what you have to do is take that HDR image and compress it down to something that you can see either in print or on a monitor. And to do that is the process is called tone mapping. And this is where we get into trouble because tone mapping can cause certain effects to be shown if people overdo it 
and people have now associated these overdone tone map to HDR, and so HDR has the look. And there is no look to HDR, because if properly done HDR, you can't tell it's HDR. Um, so what made this? Are you going to explain? Oh, so, so what I've actually done here is I just took a screen capture of the 32-bit the image that was on the screen. I mean, this is what, what that 32-bit image would look like if it was on an 8-bit display. But what made the 32-bit image? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there are programs, and I'll go into the programs, but there's programs out there, um, everything from Photoshop will do it now, and dedicated programs like Photomatics and Artisan and a few others that I'll list out. But what they actually do is they take every one of those images and bring it in and using real specific algorithms and different programs, use it a little differently. It looks at every single pixel, looks at every pixel beside it, decides what to assign to that pixel, and assigns that, and then spits out this 32-bit image. So then what you do, like I said, you tone map. So this is more of what people call natural tone mapping. This pretty much looks like what a normal picture would look like. Then people start taking and bumping things up. This one is enhanced a little bit, what people call enhanced tone mapping. This one is a lot more dramatic. You can see a little more cracks in it. This one is what people like to call grunge tone mapping, where it's really bad. This is what most people do when they first get tone mapping, is they take and move every slider to 100%. And, you, know, it, it, you know, some people really think they've got what they think is great, and it, you know, it, it sucks. One of the main things that can happen, if you look at the interface between the sky and the, the cliff face there, that's called halos. And that's one of the, the biggest banes to people that overdo tone mapping is this haloing. And that's just um, an artifact of the, the algorithms that are trying to take and map this when you overdo it. So some of the problems that you're going to run into, um, obviously moving objects are going to be a problem because you're taking multiple exposures. Um, and if you're using a single camera on a slide bar, you're, you're going to have more than that because you know, you're taking five images over here, sliding it over, and taking five images over here. Um, so you know, you're not going to be shooting HDR at the races. It's just not going to happen. Even with a, uh, a stereo camera, you're just not going to be able to do it. Things are going to move too much. But there is a lot of moving. Silence your cell phone. There's going to be uh, a lot of the anti-ghosting features in this software can take, take care of a lot of this stuff. You know, uh, flag waving in the breeze. It can actually go in and it'll choose one of the HDR images and only use the waving flag out of that and drop the other images in that area. Um, and as it's, they've progressed, they've gotten a lot better on this. Mm -hmm. The other way you can do it is you just take one of your original images and use Photoshop to mask it back in. Uh, so yeah, but that was not 3D though. Wasn't it? <laughs> nope. No, because you do the same thing in the left and the right. You use the same in, the same stereo image pair. So you use the third frame of the left and the third frame of the right and, and put it back in there. So it will work. Um, but in another case, you know how you like to take and, and slow down waterfalls with long exposures to get that real nice velvety. Doing it this way by not putting any of the anti-ghosting features in actually enhances that look and it looks a whole lot better. Um, then here it is. The, the biggest problem is the tone mapping. Um, because the, the, these HDR programs um, really look at each individual pixel, you know when you take a stereo image, that the pixels that are next to each other are not going to be the same in the left and the right. I mean, that's what makes the parallax, what's what makes stereo. Mm -hmm. So you can take and get uh, processing differences between the left and right image if there's major differences between uh, where things are set in it. Um, and the, the more intensified you take and, and pump up these settings, the worse it gets. Um, the halos that I showed you are, are the real problem. And, and the biggest problem that people have when they're first starting out is wanting to push this, but I'll show you in the program that there's uh, where those, how to take care of those. Um, noise, obviously, if you don't have enough brackets to cover the range you're in, you're, if you have solid blacks in there that you haven't covered the shadows in, that's going to turn up a noise and it's going to be really bad. If you have blown out areas that you haven't covered in your bracketing, it's going to turn out a gray mess in your, in your picture. So you really have to cover the full range. Can you explain what tone mapping is? What it is? Well, I thought it did. Tone mapping is a local contrast adjustment by taking, by com it compresses the 32-bit image down. Say you, say you have a 20-foot stepladder, but it only needs to be 8-foot tall. 
So what you're doing is you're leaving all the rungs there, you're just moving them closer together. So, and that, that compression is the tone mapping algorithm. And you as the operator of the program get to decide? What yes. Thank you. Tone mapping is in there. Yeah. Yes. Oh, tone okay. mapping is part of the program. When you showed the full HDR image, that wasn't just an 8-bit section, but that was everything compressed down to 8-bits? Correct. You just take the segment out there at the bottom. Well, it was like, say, for instance, drop out the LSB and just keep the top significant 8 bits. No, no, it, it's the full 32-bit compressed down. So, like I said, 20-foot okay. oh, ladder with the rungs, you know, one That's foot apart are now the rungs are only a foot okay. apart. It, everything is there. It's just compressed closer together. Right. And how the program determines where to put them, how close to put them together, right. whether the bottoms is going to be farther apart and the top is going to be closer together, all those are algorithms that there's 20 or 30 people out there. I was just curious about the HDLA that, right, that you showed was not just a segment of that, but was no, the No, that was the 32 full 32-bit. And okay. I'll, when I get in the program, I'll show you that. So anyway, here we go. Tone mapping, it uses the local contrast uh, operator. Uh, because each site's different, the final processing might not come out right. Uh, you want to make sure that each set, that you, when you process these, that you have all your settings the same. You, you know, you've got a scale of 1 to 100 on a slider. Uh, moving at five degrees difference between the left and the right image can make a drastic difference. So you have to make sure to set it directly or the same on both. Um, some HDR programs that uh, are out there that will do this stuff. Photomatics is probably the most common one that, that people are using. Photoshop started about CS2 with um, HDR in it. It sucked terribly. Uh, CS3, it sucked a little less. CS4 was usable, but not good. CS5 now, although I haven't used it, is supposed to be, they really drastically improved the HDR in that. Um, Artisan, Easy HDR, all these others are some that, uh, and a lot of these, um, Hydra, Photomatics, and a few others have both Mac and PC applications. A lot of the others are PC only. Nothing for GIMP. No, because, well, no, um, yes, there is GIMP. I think that um, uh, the Luminance HDR, which used to be QTPFSGUI, yeah, was the name of the program. <laughs> um, I, it, it's a command line operator, so it will run in GIMP. Is that always listed somewhere? No, but yeah, all you have to do is, is do a, a Google search on HDR software. So let's see if I can. Uh, figure out how to get down. We'll actually run the program. Yeah, that, that's, it's a squished image up there, but that's my motorcycle on HDR. Okay, so this is the actual program I use. It's called Photomatics. Um, and what you're able to do here, you can generate, in, and it has both um, uh, tone mapping and exposure fusion, so that a lot of people uh, uh, think that they can get a more natural looking image by doing the exposure fusion, which just takes two images and puts them together using like neutral density filters. Uh, but it's got both of them in there. But what we're going to do is actually generate an HDR image. And to do that, you're going to go in and you're going to go find your five exposures. In this case, if I can remember right through this one. Okay, so now we've got our five images in there. I'm going to tell it okay. The first thing that's going to come up is how you're going to generate this. So, first thing it's going to do is it's going to let you, it has a couple of different options for aligning the source images. You can either do it, if you're using a slide bar, you're, you're pretty steady on your image. You can tell it just to match it by moving it left and right and up and down. You're not going to have any rotational errors. I think the better way to do it, especially if you do any handheld or got any movement, is match features. This way it will also do rotational errors. It just takes a little bit longer to do. Um, you can take and reduce the chromic aberrations in it. Um, you can reduce the noise in it. I'm not going to do those just because it takes a little bit longer to do. And you can take and have it, and you notice it says attempt to reduce ghosting. Okay? 
And you can do that either by, um, which is pretty mild, by just doing like water or foliage and trees and shaking around, or you can do some real heavy duty ones if you've got people walking so that they're in multiple places at one time. And then you can tell it to do either uh, high or normal on that. Dave, are these images stereo pairs you're working with at this point? No, uh, what, you can, what you can do if you want, um, I, I use, I like to deal with raw images and bring in the program so I don't do stereo pairs first. But if you want, you can also take and take your raw images and, and run them through a, a camera raw or something and get and produce TIFFs and create your stereo data maker side-by-side -side file and you can run them that way and so that you can run them as a stereo pair so the whole thing is done at once on each image. So this program will, will take TIFFs? We'll take what? It'll accept TIFFs? Yes. It, um, it'll actually, the new version 4, you can do it with, uh, well, they'll all take JPEG, TIFF, uh, PNGs, uh, they'll take almost any, any file. And they will take almost every camera raw. Um, mm -hmm. And every time a new camera comes out, they add a new one to it. But even they'll tell you that their algorithm for doing camera raw demosaicism is not as good as what you can get on, you know, using something like Adobe Camera Raw. But it does such a great job on my uh, Pentex PDF files that I don't bother converting them first. So you, you go straight with raw into there? Yes, I, I, these are raw images that I just pulled in. Okay. It wouldn't, it, it, <coughs> wouldn't running the alignment thing on this, on a stereo pair, potentially screw it up? Because the left and the right won't have the same errors in it necessarily. Yeah, it, it, yes. Yeah, it, and it'll align the whole thing globally, and the left and right won't be optimally aligned individually. Yes, correct. So that's another one of the, the problems that you can run into with trying to do this on stereo pairs. So, so do it, it might be a good idea to take and convert first, do all your alignment in, in uh, uh, Photo Maker. But, the, well, let's see, no, you're not going to be able to. You're going you're gonna to have to because it's still going to take and align the images, the, the five images together. Right, but if you're uh, shooting with a tripod, do you even need to use that? that feature? Do you need to check? People? Yeah, there, the, um, it depends on how steady your tripod is. I mean, but we're talking if something is, a tripod could easily be two or three pixels out just by blowing on it. So um, there's not too many <coughs> mounts that are steady enough that you're not going to want to align an image. Um, and you do have the option of either cropping or not cropping your final image when it's aligned. Um, I always crop it because if not, you, know, I mean, you have all this extraneous stuff around where it did the aligning. Um, the other thing you can do is you can set the white balance either as shot or you can choose one of them. Um, and then your colors, I always work in sRGB because that's what I'm outputting to most of the time. So we're just going to tell it, okay, go ahead and do it there. So now, first thing it's doing, it's going to convert my raw files. <coughs> and actually, I'm going to stop it because what it's going to do, it'll just convert them and it's just going to make that HDR file. So I'm just going to go in and open it because I've already done it. it. Depending on the size of your files, I was doing five 10 megabyte files there, 50 megabytes worth. So it takes maybe 45 seconds or so to do. Normally what I do is batch processing. As you can see down here, you can just start a whole batch during the uh, night bring it in. So this is going to be my HDR image. So there it is. There's that HDR image just like I showed you. That's that 32-bit image. But you notice this thing over here at the side? This is the viewer, and it's an approximation. So see where my mouse is? As if you look around, that's what the, the, what it's actually captured in there. That's what it shows as, as its images on there. So as you go across, you can see how things change. And you can see just by going between the light and the dark area. So anyway, that'll just give you an idea. That's just a viewer on there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go into the tone mapping now. And it'll keep a histogram up there. Um, this is the default settings in the program. Um, for the most part, a lot of people just like the, the uh, default settings and they'll just leave it here. But you've got all these uh, choices over here. And unfortunately, I can show you what they do, but because they're all interconnected with each other, just if I take the strength all the way up, I might need to bump another one up to compensate for the, some of the things that are done. But this will just give you an idea. Um, the strength on here is the actual strength of the uh, program. So you can see how nice and uh, a block gets up to 100% strength. We'll take and get it. 
know, you know, I'm, I'm usually somewhere around 75 or so on the string. Um, everybody understands what saturation does, right? You take all the color out or you put all massive color in. And see, this is the other thing too, is what, as with any program, the tone mapping can be under, overdone. Saturation can be overdone, but you don't hear all these people complaining about people oversaturating all the time. So you just need to learn that. So saturation kind of is like different film stocks that are better for some. No, saturation is strictly saturation. It, it's the same everywhere. It's it's just intensifying every single one of the colors. What I mean, the effect looks like uh, some people prefer, prefer film stock because. Yeah, they, you know, people say that Fuji, Fuji, um, Velvia is more saturated uh, because the colors look brighter and stuff. Yeah, but we'll get into a little bit more down here. Uh, luminosity, everybody should know. That's just the, the global lighting of it. So down here, you get real flat lighting. Uh, take luminosity all the way up and you get... Uh, yeah. um, the micro contrast is actually the really fine um, contrast in it. So you get a real... Uh, washed out look when it's all the way off, or you get real fine uh, contrasting when it's up. This smoothing mode here is the one that will give you the halos. So the more that you take and you move it down, um, the more it's going to get. So you can see all the halos that are getting starting up over here, <coughs> along there. And if you take and you move it all the way to the, and this one's opposite, so you move it all the way to this side and then there's none of it going on. So. Uh, and they've actually got two different operators. They started out with this one that you just choose different points. And it actually used a little bit. See, even on this one, the, the mid one's starting to get no halos, and it's even getting more there. And there, it's just terrible. <laughs> so um, I like the new one. They've got this light mode here. And I'm usually somewhere, depending on the image, oh, you know, five to seven or so. more that. Um, you can set your white point. So when it's all the way off, your, your whites are going to be down. When it's all the way up, just your whites are going to be uh, enhanced. Um, I usually like to keep a white point down pretty far. No, we don't get blown out. Black point's the same way down here. There's none. You bring it all the way up. And watch your clouds. You know, they get real black. somewhere. Um, obviously gamma, everybody knows, you take gamma down and you get the overall <coughs> black and take it up. I never, I always leave gammas at one where they belong. I'm not good at these touch pads. Okay, your color temperature, if you didn't balance or not, you can take and balance it in here, so you can take it all the way to the uh, cool side, blue, or you can mm -hmm. take it all the way to the uh, warm side. Hopefully you've done your color balancing well in camera. Then the, one of the fun things you can do here is you can take and adjust jet, the saturation, adjust the highlights. <coughs> so if you're there, the, that, and it didn't show up a whole lot, you need to probably move that up a bit, but that was just the... Uh, See, only the highlights, so only the, the clouds and stuff in the highlight areas are going. And the same thing with shadows now. So you can take all the color out of just the shadows or pump up the color in just the shadows. And these last few down here, this micro smoothing. Um, it works in conjunction with the, uh, the micro contrast up there so that when it's all the way on, it smooths things out. When it's all the way off, it doesn't. So you get real, a lot harsher. Then if you get some uh, blown out areas in your, uh, your sky, this highlights smoothness, you can take and bump up and it'll take and uh, put some of that back in the sky. The same thing with shadows, if you want to smooth the shadows out a bit. Um, and then shadow clipping in case it, it doesn't have any shadows in it and you want to make sure that there are shadows in it. So basically, uh, you, you can move these around and play all you want. You can also take and they have some uh, uh, one, ones in there already. So you know, this is what they think is a natural looking image, which I don't think is. 
This one is one if you want to be, make sure your skies stay smooth. Um, there's one in here that they think makes it look like a painterly image. And like I said, in this one that everybody likes to call grunge. Um, and so as you can see, the HDR is not the thing that's giving you the look. It's this tone mapping that's giving you the look. And you have total control over what you want to do. Now, not every image is going to tone map well. And in fact, and then, then you actually just hit the, uh, when you're done, hit the process button and it does the actual tone mapping. And sometimes you will get, because the preview is, is only doing it really quickly and on the fly into a small image, um, it'll look a bit different when you actually do the processing. For the most part, if you've, if you've done it okay, there it is, your final image. And then you can save that in all sorts of different formats from JPEG to TIFF to whatever. But I went out and shot this weekend and I screwed up. Um, Um, because I was uh, using auto exposure bracketing, I didn't have enough. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah. So this one here, I didn't shoot enough brackets to cover it. So when I go into the tone mapping, it just turned out like real total. Well, it's not, it's not what I want to see. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, so what's happened here is, like I said, I didn't cover enough of the range to get the shadows and, and the uh, lighting in it. But, um, so this is just one program that will do it. Every program has a different interface, and it's going to have a slightly different look and have more or less features. Um, that one artisan and um, HDR tools, I think, is also a graphics editor as well, so it allows you to do a lot more with, with touching up your pictures and stuff as well. Which one is this? Uh, this one is Photomatics, not Photomat Matrix. There's no R in it, it's Photomatics. It's -I yeah, and it's a you know hundred dollar program, and you can go just about anybody's website that's doing it and get a coupon for fifteen percent off. So you know, and you get free upgrades for a year on it. Um, you definitely, when you're done with an HDR image in any of these programs, you're not done with it. Um, you still need to bring it into Photoshop and touch it up. You need to enhance it better. You need to take care of uh, contrast and tones and levels and sharpening and all that. It's not a it's not an end product by any means, so you still need to keep going. Yes? What kind of cameras do you have to use to do this? I mean, you got to get a in, Any camera that can take multiple exposures or have a manual mode will work. Sure. You can do this with JPEG photos if you want. You just need to take more of them because they don't cover as much range as a DSLR with a 12-bit a raw image in it. So would you like a digital SLR type camera is what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. They, they, they work best because of the auto exposure, but different manufacturers, Canon cameras, all except for one or two of the high-end models, only allow three brackets in the exposure. <coughs> um, Nikons allow up to nine, I believe, in it, nine or 11. Uh, my Pentaxes, they allow five exposures okay. in the maximum. But, you use uh, normally how many exposures? Um, you use as many exposures as you need to cover the dynamic range of the scene. Okay. However, a good rule of thumb, and most people find for the most of the time, outdoor, normally lit scenes, a three-shot exposure at 2EV will cover it. So a four uh, f-stop range will usually cover it fairly well. Does, John? does the program work better if you have smaller EV steps, or can you just take a plus and minus four EV? It will work, but it, the, the more steps you have, the better it will work, and the less noise, especially, you'll have in the image because it'll have more to work from than just the, 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 the top one and the less one. Because if your, your mid-range in there is, is not covered by either your upper or your lower, you know, you could have the range so far apart that, that it's, you know, if, if you're overlapping, you're fine. But if you move it here, you haven't covered any of the mid-range. So you have to cover, your overlap has to cover every bit of the dynamic range. 
I, I noticed your, I, I think it's a matter of your personal taste, your skies are really dramatic. <laughs> I thought they were double polarized. They yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, how, it, how would you bring just the sky back down? Well, there's all, there's also another way that it, I mean, if it, if you want it really drastically down, then what the program will do is you can take and tone map twice, tone map once for the sky, tone map once for the the other area, and just mask them in, because whatever you're doing, even though it is a, 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 a local contrast adjustment, you're still affecting all the lights in the, in the picture one way or the other. So if you bring that down, you're also going to bring down the the texture and stuff in the rocks as well as in the sky. And, but bringing that black level down is the main thing. The black level is what gets you the really storm clouds out of the white fluffy clouds. And so bringing that down will really help. Yes? Well, would you use a, like a spot meter to get these all these ranges or could the camera do that? Or we can't, well, a lot of cameras have spot meters, but no, I use just a center weighted average metering for all mine. Okay. And, and actually, for the, I'm going to tell the truth, for the most part, I'm using my camera's AEB, so I don't meter scenes, and that's why I end up screwing up sometimes. So, you know, I just take it and meter on what it's supposed to be, press the button on AEB, and usually I'm using one and a half EVs for five frames, so I cover a three EV range. If using the like, cannons like a lot of us do, the histogram up, you know, do zebra striping on stuff that's under range and over range, or from the histogram with a little red diamond up there, it says, hey, your stuff out to the right or out to the left. Yeah, as I said, one of the ways to do it manually is to get your first exposure and keep going until your histogram is covered on it. Yes? Yeah, once you uh, make all the settings, uh, the adjustments flow back to me, is there a way to see that? Yes, you can do it one of two ways. Depending on the, you know, it, we're talking about specifics and programs, so each program would act differently. You'd have to see what that program is. In Photomatics, one of the options in the settings is always use the, is when you start the program up, is come up with the last used setting. The other one is, as you saw there, you can save any setting to name it what you want. So if you get a setting you like, you can save it. Yes? When I the and the ability to select which of the images I want to cover which of the dynamic range selectors. So that if I want, for example, the plus three only to cover the top end and not overlap, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm not control over which images get weighed before it makes the HDR image. Do you find that just letting them do that thing or automatically? What program is you use to do that? Because I don't know any program. For example, Photoshop, you can say, I want this image to only cover this part of the display. Huh. And I want this image to only cover, you know, I can overlap it, so I can move that overlap around. You know, just, just another feature in another program. I've never used that, and I've always... The photomatics doesn't allow that, so and that's what I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the workflow for doing this with stereo cameras? Yeah, like I said, what I like to do when I do it, um, I have my left and right images because I'm on a slide bar. Um, I also use L'Oreal to do macro with and also um, some of the new 905 splitter. And in that case, they're just single images and I'll take and I bring it in, I tone map the image, either the, the full stereo image or the left and the right. And then I take that tone mapped image and bring it into Stereo Photo Maker and make a full size aligned pair out of it. Then I bring those back in and do all my um, manipulations of <laughs> color balance and sharpening and stuff on the side by side pair so it's all done the same on both of them. And then back to Stereo Photo Maker to do my parallels or whatever else I'm doing on them. Yeah, uh, one, one more thing about the uh, workflow is that uh, if you're not working on the two images, uh, one right after the other, the left and the right, you can save the preset of the uh, of all the settings, all the sliders that you did for the first image, and then when you work on you know the right image, then you can apply those. Yeah, that's why I highly recommend the workflow is to take in your left image or your right image, do it, and immediately do the next image because the settings are still there. Then move on to your next image, change what needs to be changed. Every image will change. You're, you're not going to want these presets. The, it, it's amazing. Just the littlest amount of change in an image can really change how the effects of the tone mapping are. So um, don't get in the habit of, of just hitting the, the default settings and thinking it's fine. Play around and tweak every single image. Yes? I know that uh, Photomatics is a plugin for Photoshop. Have you used that? Um, I don't use it as a plug-in, I use it as a standalone, but it works the same way. 
So, and a lot of, there's some people that will take and split programs. They'll maybe do their aligning in Photoshop because Photoshop does a really great job of aligning images and then bring that into Photomatics to do the tone mapping. And the one other thing that, that when people were talking about tone mapping and, and we started out about talking about HDR and what it is, you can tone map a single image and you can get it to come out looking like some of this. You are never going to be able to tone map more dynamic range into a single image than what's there to begin with. But you can create the tone map look from it. But then again, you can use other programs that aren't HDR, like um, uh, Topaz Adjust, like LucasArts, to get that cartoon look out of pictures without ever having to going into that from a single image. So, yes? If you don't have the tone mapping software or a special HDR software, say you're shooting a, a shot that's pretty good except it has one dark area here, you could, can you get about the same thing, get most of what you want by this? Uh, expo yeah, exposure blending is what you're talking about, and yes, it's no different than using a neutral density, using Photoshop layers to blend in dark and light areas. But if, you know, if you're shooting through a tree that's got 3,000 light areas in it, yes, you can go in pixel by pixel and change every one of those or, you know, 10 pixel areas and do all that. But, you know, you're going to spend 300 hours on a picture that takes 15 minutes in, in this program to do. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, almost every single one of the, the programs out here, including Artisan and some of those others too, not LucasArts, they want 600 bucks for their plug-in. But all these others offer free downloads, totally working programs, no restrictions, well, two of them, one of them restricts the size, no more than 1024 by 768. Most of them just put a watermark on your final image. And if you buy the program, there's a, a key in here that will go back and you can put that image back in and it'll remove the watermarks. So go in and, and, and it never expires. So you can go in and process all you want until you decide that it's going to be what you want by the program and then you've got those images that just removes the watermarks. Hmm. Okay. All right, thanks a lot.